welcome to the first uh, Telwarden uh, AMA session, uh, where we aspire to, to bring people together through conversations with subject matter experts around anything that really has to do with, with cloud, with uh, open source, um, community, and more. And today we're going to be talking to, to Bart Farrell, a good friend of mine, who is here to shed some light on uh, for community managers and uh, like myself. But, uh, but also for community members and uh, open source contributors, hopefully um, uh, Bart will be able to speak to, to how they can get the best value from, from these types of communities. So yeah, just to uh, introduce Bart, uh, Bart is a cloud native community consultant and a content creator. He's also a CNCF ambassador and a masterful community manager, having um, spearheaded the data on Kubernetes community for close to three years, I think it was. And uh, when it comes to talking about open source and community topics, uh, uh, he's really a, a reference in the field. And I'm happy to have the chance to talk to you today, Bart. Um, yeah, having said all this, in, in your words, what how would you um, kind of summarize your what you've been interested in the last few years? And, and, and what are you up to now? Wow. Um, well, thank you for the wonderful introduction and very nice to be here. In terms of, you know, although what I've done the last few years has been very focused on this, I think for a lot of people that are, the, might think they're new to this space, and in reality they're not, because community is something that's not just something that happens in, you know, a Discord or a Slack, you know, since we're children, um, we're in communities, whether they're our families, our schools, or a different kind of organizations. And so there's a lot of, you know, lessons that you can extract from, uh, from those experiences. But in my particular case, uh, for the last, two and a half years being very focused on online, well, I mean, I would say technical communities that, that uh, predominantly work in, in online spaces. And so I have been a freelancer for the last five years, but started working in tech eight years ago. And when I, when I started working for a British software development firm um, here in Bilbao in the north of Spain, I was focused on um, internal knowledge sharing initiatives. So we had about over 120 developers in three different development centers. So how can you make sure that those silos are broken down and that there's fluid communication so that people are helping each other grow and establishing you know, career objectives and, and making sure that based on the business needs that uh, regarding the different technologies that were being used, that were people were being provided the adequate resources and time to consume those resources. And then in addition, organizing events with, uh, with different companies and universities, local government in the ecosystem here. And so then from there, um, two and a half, it, well, it'll be three years in August, I had the opportunity to start uh, working with the data on Kubernetes community. And just as you know, full disclosure, I come from a very non-technical background, but there are a lot of different skills that can be leveraged in the community space. And I think for most people, you'll find that if you're quite transparent about where you're at um, and, and on the technical side, People don't really have a problem. It's your job as a community manager to be able to know if someone has a question about this particular topic, uh, who can I put them in touch with so that those conversations can happen and that person can get one step closer to their goals. So I would say a lot of, a lot of what I do is getting into different spaces and finding out who, um, you know, who are community members that are, that are quite active as well as others that are getting close to being more active and, and what are the things that, that are going to stimulate them? What are the ways to get them more involved and, and how to help that community get closer to the goals that they're trying to achieve? Because a lot of, every community is different and a lot of what I, we talk about is that not every community's goals, and community goals are gonna be different depending, yes, we, you know, in general, we're talking about open source, we want adoption and things like that, but goals will be different based on that, metrics will be different, and, and what are the things that make it tick? You know, each, each community has to have its own unique look and feel. If we look at the amount of, you know, competitors that are out there, if we wanna look at it that way, there are a lot. And so how many Discord servers, Slack servers uh, can we be on? And we're all probably in dozens. And what, it, what is it that's going to make it stand out? What is it that, you know, I always say three rules. Why are people going to come? Why are they going to stay? And why are they going to tell their friends? If it's only the community manager who's the one, you know, evangelizing or, or sharing the good news about, about this space, the reach will be much more limited than if community members themselves are doing so. Um, so that's, that I would say, you know, in, in the long and short of it sort of is, is, is my approach. And but like I said, I can give more examples later, but each community really has its own, its own pulse, its own pace, 
um, its own progress, uh, its own challenges, and based on those challenges, we'll have solutions that are tailored to them. Cool. No, thanks a million. Um, just going back to something that that you said there at the beginning is like that uh, that you're not that uh, technically uh, skilled, but um, you you also said that uh, you've been uh, in this kind of like community space um, for the last eight years, and you've come an incredibly long way in that time. And and I can tell because I know you before those eight years. Like in in those eight years, you've been you've been able to acquire some some in, incredible skills and uh i know i know you uh, for more than eight because before you got into this space you and i we lived in the same uh city and we were both english teachers at the time we actually even uh started our own it wasn't it wasn't really a community right but it was a little project that we had uh, with another friend of ours uh, another english teacher we called it a good morning bill bow it, it would we we would take Remember the the like local news articles, we would translate them and transcribe them and record them. So we would have a little bit more kind of like relevant and dynamic ma- teaching material in our English classes. What do you kind of remember from from that time? Is, is there anything like in those kind of like early projects that, that you would do in your like early 20s that have kind of like informed the way you work now or? Absolutely. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that because it's, it's not something that I, that, I mean, I, I very clearly remember doing that, but in a lot of ways, you know, I wouldn't call what we were doing exactly a startup, but what it was responding to is something that I always stress, whether in any open source project or community is the topic of pain points, right? So we were English teachers and in terms of our students, you know, consuming material that was just sort of generic English stuff about, you know, like the, the car goes down the street and parks next to the office. If we can provide more context, you know, at a local level for things that people can relate to much more, it's going to be m- much more exciting for them to be speaking about things that, that they know and, and have something to, to share about rather than, like I said, something that just sort of run of the mill. So I think, I think on, on the side of identifying a pain point, and I think it's still a good idea, and if you want to start uh, Good Morning Good Well again, I, like I, I still think, there's, I still think there's, there's value in that. It's just a question of time and, and needing the right backing. But I think what it does, what it definitely shows, is the, the necessity of applying creativity to your community. And so that if, if and, there, and that there's going to be trial and error there. And so, you know, you start out with one model and so you want, you want to be able to test things and, and if they fail, that's okay. And that they fail quickly, better. And getting feedback. Um, the feedback that we got when we were doing Good Morning Midval was really, really good. And also it was quite niche because no one else was doing anything, you know, that um, in that sort of way. So I think that, and the other thing as well too, and from a community perspective is that we started getting people telling us like, hey, why don't you write an article about this? Or have you thought about speaking about that? And that's, that's the, the, best, like the best sort of scenarios that you can have in a community is when your community members are coming to you with suggestions. In the sense of open source, you want people to be suggesting features because you, you know that you know, 15 end users that, are, um, that fit the profile of, of the, the kind of you know, community profiles that you're looking for then you know that you're responding to their needs. And so I think that's sort of uh, the importance of listening and getting quantitative feedback, obviously in the sense of Good Morning Midwell, we can say through, through metrics about you know, how, many, you know, how many clicks are we getting, how many people are, are downloading, how many people are going to SoundCloud to listen to, the, to the, the audio while reading the articles. Those things are important, but then the qualitative side of actually reaching out to people and having conversations and yes, those things take more time, but I think any community manager needs to be looking at both. Nowadays, there are better, better, better tools to be looking at community metrics. We can probably talk about that a little bit further down the line. But I think the qualitative side of really listening, taking that feedback into consideration, and then showing others, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, if you ask for feedback and you don't show people that you're taking that into consideration, saying, we've heard you, thank you, these were the top responses that we got, these are suggestions that you've made, let people vote on which ones they think are the best so that they become a part of it, and that it's, a, you know, that it's not a monologue, but a dialogue. Um, I think that in virtually any project that you're doing is, is absolutely essential. Because, and, and it really helps you out a lot too, because you may think that you have the greatest idea in the world, but if your community or your, you know, your users are pulling you in another direction, you definitely need to keep that in mind so that they don't feel alienated or abandoned later on. 
Yeah, and that's actually a perfect segue for the next question that I that I had for you here because you're touching on the the fact that it, it's not only important that that you as a as a kind of like a content curator as a community kind of manager you think that something's going to work. You, there there really is no substitute for um, a data driven approach, right? And just um, have a clear insight into the metrics that you care about, the metrics that kind of inform you of of the route that you're going down, if it's the right one or not. But speaking of those metrics, because as as a community developer myself, sometimes it's not always that clear which ones are the right ones to listen to, which ones are kind of vanity metrics that in the long run really aren't helping out. So in your opinion, how do you measure success um, of an open source community? Are there like what are the specific metrics or indicators that you find particularly useful, uh, both for community maintainers or, uh, or or also for the community members themselves? That's great, and and once again, I would say it goes back to goals. So ba- your goals will help you out a lot in terms of deciding your metrics. So if you say like our goals are that we want, you know. 100 people in the next quarter or that we want to see the, you know there once again vanity metrics exist for a reason everybody likes github stars there's no denying that however there are certain hacks and tricks that you can use to get a, to, to get to those metrics yet often for any open source project what i would say is that you may have somebody out there who's making a lot of noise you know who's really pushing it who's talking to a lot of people but once someone gets into that once someone makes a decision to get into your community how long does it take for them to get onboarded and start participating? You know, what are, generally speaking, if you look at, you know, I interact with a lot of projects that are in the CNCF landscape. So if you look at projects that have good documentation, well, I said, you know, if, if we look at, you know, what are good first issues um, for people to start getting involved so that they can make themselves visible, they can get introduced, they can get onboarded. And that relates to, you know, there are push and pull strategies. So like, if you're only just expecting people to jump into your Discord server, your Slack, it's get ready for some painful moments um, because it takes time. And so you have to be thinking about where are the, based on the, the kind of person who I want to be interacting with, where are they, right? They're in other Slacks and Discord servers and, and, and other spaces already. How can you be out there interacting with them in a way where they can see you there in public, in public spaces without having to DM them? If you start DMing people with, you know, you better have something really, really cool to offer um, because it, it's like, if you don't know this person, they're already going, it feels like it might be too sales based. So if you're out there showing, offering knowledge and sharing knowledge in these spaces, then it's only natural to say, oh, Jake works here and this is what he's doing. I'm interested now in finding out more. And a lot of what we talk about, you know, is, is a base, even though marketing is a bad word in this space. Um, you know, ba- one of the basic rules of marketing is, you know, the acronym AIDA, which is for attention, interest, desire, and action. So how are we going to get someone's uh, attention? Targeting a pain point saying, you know, 99% of, you know, platform engineers are spending too much time on this problem or whatever it happens to be. All right. Then we develop that a little bit further. This person starts thinking, hmm, perhaps there's something here that's going to help me out. And then what's the action that they can take, right? Going back to, like I said, the metrics, basic things that you're going to look at no matter what. You're going to be looking at monthly active users, all right? And it can even be daily active users. There are different tools to measure that, which could be Comsor, it could be Orbit. Um, the, and these tools are improving. Also seeing where people are coming from. So are our, is, you know, our efforts on Twitter working, our efforts on LinkedIn working? How is it that people are finding out about, um, about our project and getting involved? Those, those kind of things are, are get, but also once again, is that if people don't have a reason to talk on Slack or Discord, getting angry at them for not talking is kind of silly, right? You need to make it easy for them. If people walk into a Slack channel and they see that there's nothing going on, probably going to be difficult for them to, to, to interact. Basic rule of communities as well as the 99-1 rule, 90% of your community members are going to be silent and they're going to be lurkers. 9% will be somewhere in between and then it's 1% that are really doing most of the talking. Finding those 1% users and making sure that they're happy and that they're being engaged. And those are the people that will probably be more likely to give you that qualitative analysis. There's a great thing called the jobs to be done method, where by interviewing people, you figure out what are you doing well and what are the things that you should be doing more of, all right? Making sure that those people are being respected and listened to, um, I think that is once again, so that's not just the core team that's doing all the heavy lifting. Um, those are things that are, that are definitely going to want to be there. 
But like I said, there needs to be an audit first of where you're at, looking across all channels. How are we doing on YouTube? How are we doing on Slack or Discord? How are we doing on Twitter? How are we doing you know, on, on GitHub? Then looking at how can we reduce the time from when someone joins to their first contribution um, and interacting with them. It's not so much a metric, but I think that every community needs to find a way for people to have conversations that aren't just about the open source project, but based on your, you know, and the folks that are in there, how can there be a sort of show and tell about things that are not necessarily purely technical, which could be memes, it could be movies, it could be music, it could be food. What are the things that people have in common that, that they also like talking about? Once people have the opportunity to become connected just as humans in a, in a sort of friendship kind of way, then those conversations around the open source project are only going to get stronger and stronger because the person that's behind that avatar is a person who you actually know. Um, so fostering, creating opportunities for people to have those experiences, designing those experiences. A lot of what I talk about is community architecture. In the same way, if you walk into a bar or a, a coffee shop or whatever, how are the seats distributed? Are there couches where people might have to be sharing them that don't know each other? Um, what kind of music is playing? In, in the same way in an online format, what are the kind of things that you're creating so that people feel like they're not having to take a leap of faith um, to get involved? Always going back to this sort of very simple, um, simple formula of, you know, don't ask, offer, right? If you're asking me to do something, you can only ask so many times and say, no, 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 I'm offering you the chance to show your knowledge, to share what you're good at, to tell us what we're not doing right. Um, and, in, and it's not going to work, you know, the, the first time, if it works, great, but don't kill yourself if it doesn't. It's going to take, you know, trial and error, but make your community part of the solution. If it's just you doing all the work on your own, it's going to be really, really hard. Find people who can give you honest feedback. Um, I, I, I can't stress that enough. Perfect. Thanks a minute. That's really, really helpful from my perspective or for the, from the perspective of a community a developer, someone who's, who's, who's trying to, their best to, to create um, uh, a, an, an environment that creates value for the members in it. But if we put ourselves in the shoes of the community member or of an open source contributor, what could they, and I, and I know that there, there might be a lot of parallels to what you were just talking about, but from the perspective of a, a member who isn't seeing the metrics, who honestly doesn't really care about the metrics of how good or bad the community is doing, but what indicators, what should the member aspire to see in a, in a community that, that gives value? I mean, because, like, why shouldn't an open source contributor just simply go to the GitHub repo, make their contributions, interact with the maintainers on a pull request, and then go off on their date? Like, why take a next step and go onto, uh, onto, a, onto some sort of a platform to then be part of a community? What should the, the community member, in the best case scenario, aspire to kind of receive in, in terms of value? Very good. And, and related to that, you know, we often, the thing that we talk about a lot is, you know, the pyramid of Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs and something that people may have seen, may not have seen. And one of the, one of the needs that's in there, like kind of smack dab in the middle of the pyramid is the, you know, belonging. And so like providing meaningful experiences. And so what is a meaningful experience? I know it can be very subjective, but I think a big thing is that we all like being recognized for our work. Some people, and sometimes recognition can be too much. And so you have to figure out based on the profile of our users, you know, of our community members, what kind of recognition is gonna be best for them. Is it going to be swag? Is it going to be that we give them a shout out? Um, what are the different ways that we can celebrate our community victories? And so that it's something that people see, oh wow, you know, like I did something and I got credit for it and people are really taking care of me. Something that comes up a lot too in you know, conversations of the CNCF, uh, CNCF projects or open source projects is feeling that sometimes developers might feel like, oh, I'm just being you know, juiced or manipulated for my hours in order to contribute to a project that actually has business goals behind it, that there's gonna be um, you know, the, the enterprise version or things like that. So making sure that, that it definitely doesn't feel that way and that people see that they that they have buy-in and that they're creating impact. I think, I think that's one of the really attractive things about open source is that you directly get to be involved in something, become a part of it. And so you have the big projects, you know, like Kubernetes, which obviously, you know, has tons of branding behind it and, you know, lots and lots of the second biggest open source project after Linux. 
But then I think also in my experience as well, like participate in smaller projects, you get to have much more impact. And so like that's also figuring out the kind of end users that you're going to attract are ones where you say like, look, we may not have all the glamour and things like that, but this is a, a tight knit group um, where you really will have much more influence than you would in other spaces. Who are the kind of folks that are looking for those kind of experiences and how can you be interacting with them, making it very, very clear what you're offering. And then you also have to be thinking about though in terms of scaling and these things always can create some kind of tension and friction. If things go well, you're gonna have more contributors. And so how do you make sure that those OG contributors that have been there for longer still feel like they're being taken into consideration and not just at the expense of you know, rapid growth? If, if anyone is in the community space or interested in this, you know, like you're, if you spend any time looking around at resources, you're definitely going to come across John O'Bacon, um, who's written books about this. And, and he's written a lot about DevRel and, and, and also, like I said, has a couple of books about, about community. But when growth, when there's a, and I understand a lot of companies are backed by, you know, venture capital and, and once again, metrics, 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 we want to see growth. But when we talk about utilization and engagement, this is something that John O treated, uh, tweeted about recently. So utilization meaning, is it just downloading something? What is our definition of utilizing, all right? And once again, going back to the idea of, of offering, not asking. If, if you tell somebody, I, want you, I, I was just asked this recently by, uh, by a company that's in the artificial intelligence space. They're trying to get you know, feedback from engineers. Everybody wants feedback. The, and so they sent over something that's a, like a sort of survey that took about 40 minutes to fill out. And it's also asking a lot of questions about what are your favorite tools and what do you like to do this and what do you like to do that? And with the promise of the chance to win an Amazon gift card, and it's like, okay, how many people are actually gonna take 40 minutes of their time for a company that's not very well known to actually go through this and do this? It's a big ask. What is your offer? I'm offering you quick thing, get in here, show us a bug, tell us what's wrong, whatever it happens to be, and always thinking about it very selfishly for the other person. What's in it for them? Why are they gonna care? So like I said, utilization and then engagement, very uh, sort of slippery word, because like, what does that mean? But, but like I said, is that if it's only focused on numbers, you can get the numbers, but really drilling down on what does engagement mean for your community? Does it mean direct conversations with people? Does it mean interviews? Does it mean that they're gonna give talks? Does it mean that they're gonna write stuff? Um, does it mean long conversations on Slack? Sometimes as well too, and for example, talking about tooling. Tooling can get very, very provocative. I always give this example of how the debate between whether a company that I was working with was going to use Team City or Jenkins almost tore the entire DevOps team apart um, because it got really, really heated. Sometimes those things about a provocative discussion about do we like this one or do we like that one, um, please state you know, your opinions. You have to be careful because sometimes people can get really, really, can be very sensitive and, and can get um, aggressive. If you're going to be working community, you're going to have to deal with conflict resolution at some point. And so how do you deal with it with in a positive way? If you see that someone's very energetic and passionate about something, how can you channel that into other areas of the community and give that per empower that person? Cause you see this person does like to talk. They do have strong opinions. How can I use that energy in a constructive way and avoid it from becoming destructive because people will be like, well, I don't want to be here. If this person's here now, I'm uncomfortable. Um, but, but like I said, creating those opportunities to get the engagement that you want, that you're designing. And, and then I think then growth is going to be a natural extension of that. Um, but first drilling down on how do we create organic, natural, regular conversations between people where they're sharing ideas and getting excited and supporting each other and learning from each other. Everybody has something to offer. How can you, how can you tap into that? Whether it's when they introduce themselves in the channel saying like, and make sure when you, you know, a lot of people do this with automated messaging. We did this on, on Slack with Zapier. I think Zapier also works on, on Discord. So when people arrive, they get, a, they get a, a welcoming message. This is where you can go. If you want to talk about this, go here. If you want to talk about that, go there. Don't overwhelm them with too many options. Make it short, sweet, and simple. But because once again, if I have to read this much text uh, just to get started, maybe I'm really busy. Maybe I don't want to do it. Maybe you say, go into the introduction channel and say, if you like pizza with or without pineapple, you know, classic debate sort of questions or coffee or tea or Pepsi or Coca-Cola or, you know, things like that, you know, easy ways for people to get in there and start introducing themselves. 
I always go back to this, make it as human as possible. And then the technical stuff, um, it kind of just takes care of itself. Cause if they've come, if they've come to your community, knowing something about your open source project, you know, that part's already kind of going to be there. Um, you also want that to get out in the open, but at the same time, the quicker that people get to know each other as people for a community manager, it's kind of, you need to be a bit of a jack of all trades. And so I, based on what they've told me, how can I engage with that further? Um, how can I get them to, to share more, whether it's on the technical side or maybe more just about their life experience? I think these are the things that start to create robust spaces where you all of a sudden you don't have one community manager you have several and and they're driving those conversations with natural curiosity in a way that doesn't feel forced or fake yeah totally i mean I, engagement that's definitely like an elusive kind of uh, idea and a, a, a concept but uh, and I have maybe like struggled a little bit, especially as a community developer, trying to um, improve on that. But one thing that I've definitely uh, learned, not only from like observation, but just like self observation, when I'm personally personally not motivated to do a task, sometimes, or most times it has to do with I don't necessarily, I'm not that connected to how you or to, I'm not that connected to knowing how useful it is in the long run. Like when we're just doing things just to do things, but it's it's hard to kind of put it into to context. But when you know in like the grand scheme of things, something that you're doing now is actually useful and you know in which way it's useful, then it becomes much more meaningful. And uh, as I was thinking that um, Anu um, wrote in the chat here that, uh, that, he, that he feels the same way, he wrote, um, I get to learn a lot when I try to contribute in a real world open source project this alone is a big motivation for me and i think that that kind of and i'd be interested to to know if you agree for community developers i think it's we're bridging the gap right and kind of like goes we're bridging the information gap and it kind of goes back to the project where we were translating um articles into english what we're trying to do is making it clear what is useful how somebody can can um not only participate and get a pr um merged and then they get a badge like hey thanks a million yeah you helped us out but if we make it clear how you're being impactful and then of course to your point we recognize how that impact was very very useful to 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 us as a community and uh, and then people derive that kind of value and and they get motivated by that how, how important do you think it it is to to make that usefulness as clear as possible i i think it's ex i think it's extremely important and that when and, and like i said you know we're always talking this is a topic that i've mentioned time and time again is attention economics right so we only have so much attention that we can that we can give. We have tons of distractions, so we have to start from the from from the from this starting point, right? That nobody cares about your open source project. Well, why would they care, right? Like you are going against a lot of other factors. What is it that you are offering that is going to make it worth it? And if you can't explain that, not even in thirty seconds, but in ten, we often say this. You know, how do you summarize this in a tweet? You know, in terms of the value prop. And also you have to be thinking about, and this is a common topic in, in communities as well. Some, some open source projects might be, you know, more advanced if we want to talk about that, you know, for example, like eBPF, you know, this, uh, we talk about Cilium and things like that. Um, these are quite advanced. Does it mean that they can't have, you know, users that don't have a lot of experience? Absolutely not. I mean, of course they can. And so how are you addressing, you know, you're, once again, you have to be thinking about, ideally, I want, you know, engineers with this kind of background, with this kind of skill set, with these kinds of um, experiences. At the same time, I always think about it this way, until you can explain your open source project to your neighbors, to your family members, to a child, you probably don't know it well enough. And I just say that in the sense of these things are very complex, but until they can be translated into more simple language, I think it's gonna be a problem. And why is it also a problem? Because unless you're only addressing end users from one country where they're native English speakers, if you're really going for the entire world, everyone's coming at this with a different you know, language background as well. So being able to explain things as simply as possible, 
I think, like I said, is, is you're going to have to have that 30 second explainer, that one minute explainer, that, and then in five minutes you can scale it out, but it's got to start at the very beginning. If I go to an open source project and the first thing I see is a demo video that's an hour long, probably not going to work, right? Probably not going to, because I'm busy, or I got a lot of stuff going on. Like, I, maybe they're really nice people, but uh, then they're going to have to explain it to me individually. But if, in terms of the resources that you have, what are the easiest? You know, so, it, and once again, it's like, are you a total beginner? Are you someone that has somewhat ex some experience? How can we channel those people? How can we fast track them to the areas where they need to be? One thing that we did that I'm, that I'm very happy about and that I will be doing for the rest of my open source life um, that we did in the data on Kubernetes community is we made it, data on Kubernetes is generally, generally the kind of folks that are working on day two operations. We're talking about database and storage on Kubernetes are people that have uh, generally, I would say more than five and probably more likely more than 10. And in, in a lot of cases with the folks in the community, more than 15, in some cases more than 20 years experience. Does that mean that total beginners don't have a place? Absolutely not. What we did is that we took our research report, which was a 15 page document, which is mostly statistics and graphs with short explanations. And so we had a significant group of young people come in and say, look, all we want you to do, read the research report, write down the words that you don't know, go look them up. That way we build out a glossary for people that are new that want to come in and they want to learn the same terminology. You're helping them. Also the learning and public factor. So like I said, you, and because then those folks are very, very energetic. And once they start building a, an understanding, then it makes it easier for them to get in those other conversations that maybe are a little bit more advanced. And for the advanced folks, some of them like to having the experience of paying it forward with younger people. So when you have an environment where community members are teaching each other, that cross-pollination of ideas, as well as different generations, and they all learn from each other as well. Maybe for someone who's 45 years old, getting in a Discord server is overwhelming. For someone who's 18 or 20, it's like they've been doing this now for two or three years. Um, like I said, those, those things, those things are, um, it takes time, but they can be unlocked. And I, and I really stress that for every, for every community mem member and manager is figuring out how you can provide that. What are the things that people need to know in order to get active in the simplest way possible? Less is more. What's the basic package that you need to give in order for people to get started? Yeah, I mean, everything that you're saying, they're just kind of like, uh, sounds to me like like one word which is like um how can you be inclusive like to to people in all kind of uh, of all backgrounds of all experience levels i definitely was uh i remember when i got into technology just maybe like four years ago i i'd, I'd never um had much experience at all and i was like under the 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 impression that you really needed to to, to have a, a huge amount of experience before doing anything of, of value really but but then you realize that um, there are a lot of ways that even if you're a complete beginner you can be included and and you can create value and get a lot of satisfaction even if you're if, if you're learning a lot and there's definitely yeah. um, a, a question that I have a little bit later on for you um, around how you have managed to to be quite creative in the content that you've created uh, to to kind of like uh, uh, in 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 the communities that you've been involved in, and uh, I'm wondering if if you had uh, inclusivity in mind when when coming up with that content. But before that, we have a question here from Anu, which um, yeah yeah I read it. It's a really good question. Yeah, about you know the contributor ladder about you know you're going to start here and how do you get from there to there one thing i always say is that behind you know cilium you know shout out to cilium and also shout out to isovalent uh, one of the you know best community people who i know and without his support and guidance would not be able to do a lot of things that i'm doing um is bill mulligan and so he's he's working a lot in the cilium project and has been instrumental in that and bill is absolutely committed to to being inclusive and, and making sure that people are getting plugged in the right way and that they don't feel like they have to learn everything all at once. Because I really like Anu's question is that people don't need to feel like they need to learn everything. Yeah, they're awesome, all right? So I got to hang out with them in, in Amsterdam. Um, and, and we'll talk about the creative content later as well because I did something for CiliumCon for that. But I think in the same way that an open source project has you know, that sort of uh, ladder, communities can have that as well. You start out with your introduction, but slowly but surely, what are, based on your goals, 
What are the actions that you want community members to be taken, taking based on that? How are you designing environments and opportunities for them to do so? How are you making it easy? The idea of people are just gonna jump in here and start doing a bunch of stuff is very idealistic and very naive, all right? Of course, we would love that to happen. I always say it this way. People are like children. Make it really, really simple, all right? If you're not, what are you asking me to do? What are you offering me? What's the opportunity? What am I gonna gain from this? And so I think with communities as well as thinking, based on our goals and objectives, what are the actions that we want people to be taking? How can we make it as simple as possible? And if there's something that we're missing, internally, things look super clear. This is a great idea, we're absolutely brilliant. It gets out there, and then if we don't have ways of getting feedback, and I'm not saying send community members 15 surveys every week, right? People that will burn people out really quickly. But if you have a couple of people that are in that 1%, if we go to 99.1, 99, how can you tap into those resources and say, hey, look, uh, before we send this out, I'd like to get your feedback to make sure if we're missing something that maybe we can, um, we can add it before, before putting it out there. Um, but reward criticism, reward that kind of feedback. You want to make it very, very clear that you really value that and saying, if you just say, give us your feedback, it's probably not going to be enough. Um, so I think that, and, and also, you know, as often as possible, make these things collaborative. So if you're going to have, you know, the, the contributors ladder like they do in Cilium or in other open source projects, how can other people participate in that? How can you be piece by piece saying, you know, to get to here, first there are three to four steps um, before that. That can also be built into, you know, sort of rewards program or like I said, becoming an ambassador or something like that. It's not something you need to do in the very beginning, but conceptually over time, eventually you want to say for our top users, for our top contributors, um, they get, you know, like I said, an opportunity to give a talk. Um, they get some, you know, custom swag that's limited. They get on a hall of fame. We put their picture on there. Some kind of way to gamify it. I think if I'm understanding on this question correctly, which is a great question gamifying it so that it's it's just adding that extra level of experience um, to being a part of the community i think is um and it's going to be different in each space you know cilium uses you know eb because of ebpf you know the b is sort of their mascot how can you build that sort of uh mythology if you want to in there um how can you how can you bring these concepts that are very technical how can you bring them to life in a different way and that will probably relate to uh to jake's further question about creative content yeah, which I'll get to now, but, but what just comes to mind is that um, with the, and, and I think uh, Anu's right to see it as a kind of like a gamification, because two things that usually come to mind w with games is that, well, first of all, games for the most part are fun, so you kind of want to do something. I, I think we've all um, tried out Duolingo once or twice, right? Like uh, you, you don't necessarily think you're going to be studying Italian for for a year, but you you want those those little points, you know, and and so it becomes a fun kind of thing that you engage with. And the second thing about games is that they're structured, you know. So it's it's kind of like difficult difficult to, um, it, it, especially if it's structured structured correctly, you're going to be able to uh, know what's going to be the next step. You're going to know where you are inside of the momentum uh, of the game, inside the momentum of the contribution ladder, and that kind of clarity is uh, maybe kind of like links back to the usefulness. You, you know how this is being useful, how this contribution is going to um, add to um, the, the grand scheme of things. Um, but, but yeah, the, but yeah, this, this kind of like reminds me of, uh, of, of going back uh, that the, the thing about uh, games too is that can, they can be creative. And you are definitely one of the more creative uh, content creators out there uh, especially with your raps how, how did that how did that come about and um how uh the, yeah like the the raps in general like you must be a a, a big hip-hop fan yes um and this is of course in the days before chat gpt and i've never used chat gpt to write lyrics just for the record but um when i when i got started out with you know interviewing people about really low level topics it was like, okay, this stuff is really dense. It's really technical. Is there any way that we can kind of bring this stuff to life? And I was quite clear very, like early on, I was like, we're, we're going to need to do this. And, but it wasn't, these things, nothing, you know, comes from nowhere. So like when I was a kid, my parents put me in theater classes. I've been playing music since I was nine, started with piano, then I've drums and guitar and then bass, and then started making hip hop beats when I was 26. And when, 
getting into the, like I said, online, online spaces where in order for these things to stand out, if, if just another tweet about check out our session about, you know, S3 buckets and how storage can change your life. I was like, okay, that's, that's a bit boring. Um, and I will say this as well. And also because of just being at KubeCon, it's like every company is so terrified of doing something different that everyone ends up doing everything pretty much the same. In my case, it's like, well, this is going to be pretty easy to stand out because when we see so many things that are so similar, um, it's not going to be that much of a challenge to sort of break away from that. And so very early on, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to do like summaries of what the convert, you know, as a way of thanking the speakers that we had, but then also giving them, because if we say like, please share this tweet about your talk, um, saying that I had a great time in this community talking about this or that, that's okay. And you can still do that. But my thing was like, okay, we're going to give every speaker original piece of artwork. So we had someone doing graphic recordings, like drawing on a tablet, like while the speaker is speaking. So creating a visual summary of what they've done. Then we use that as our headers on the blogs. But then in addition, you know, one thing about any kind of piece of content, unless it's, you know, in terms of interviews or webinars or stuff like that, or podcasts, unless it's something, you know, really specific about like an event or something that's very time attached, most of those things are things you're going to want to share more than once because maybe people don't get it the first time, you know, the classic thing, you know, in case you missed it and stuff like that. But if, so with that in mind, it was like the creating a wrap for each speaker, it meant that we have one more thing to share, something that they're going to be more excited about sharing, something that gives us a unique identity and, and also a way to make these things fun. Because I think I've always been a big believer that like, if you can have fun while doing your job, well, that's probably better than not having fun. And particularly with things that are very tangible, like very not tangible and very technical is a way to sort of breathe life into them. And, and also to, um, to, to, to set a tone that's like, you know, that we're, that we're here to have fun and that, and that, and also inviting others to do the same thing. And so with me in, in my case, very early on, I was like, all right, we're going to do this rap thing. And then, so I think did about uh, over 150, um, and some were better than others, but it was a way for me as well to use hip hop beats that I've been creating for a long time. Then eventually started using other ones that were out there, but it was, I, what I kind of want to get to with that is that. For me, in the same way that it was like, okay, my community is a, is, is a space where I can blend these things that I like, it was also a way to invite others to do the same thing. And it worked. We got people talking about food. We started doing a, an internal spinoff called The Outer Nerd, where people could come and talk about Dungeons and Dragons or literature or music or riding motorcycles or things like that. And giving then other community members who previously maybe didn't interact with that person say, oh, I also have a motorcycle or I also play the guitar. And so, like I said, then you create those natural organic conversations. Then those people say, oh, so you're also a Postgres engineer. I've been working on this, you know, extension for a while or this operator, things like that. So then it makes those other conversations just all the more natural. I'm not saying everybody has to do it that way, but finding a way to make it easier for people to blend the things that they like um, with the technical stuff that they're doing. I think it, it, it's a really, it's like I said, is it, as much as we're having these very technical experiences, at the end of the day, we're all people and, and we all want to have very human interactions as well. So how can we have the best of both worlds? Yeah, I, I knew this question was coming, but uh, Mohammed is asking when you and I plan to collaborate on a rap song. And I mean, to be honest, I'm all about creative content. I'm all about trying new things, but I'm going to leave the rapping. <laughs> Do you? Oh, no, no. I would answer Mohammed's question with soon and very soon. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. We got another we got another question. All right. So, so okay. we'll get to we'll get to this question oh, yeah, cool. now from from Shabam. But then right after, if you don't mind, we'll move on to the rapid fire uh, question uh, question section. Okay. But uh, yep. but yeah, we've got time for this one. So it okay. says, um, hey, Bart, loving the session so far. I'm curious to learn how can someone who's contributed to an open source project quite a few times and is getting pretty familiar with the project take the big, the next big step? Like, what is it? Like, uh, like I always see videos, articles that say how to get started in open source and any tech. But what happens after that? Very, that's, a, that's a really good question. 
And I think it's kind of up to the person, you know, because this is something I've talked to a lot of folks about, you know, there's, now that, you know, for example, the developer relations is growing so much of the field and things like that. I've, I've done public speaking training for lots of people inside the CNCF and outside uh, on how to give talks because, you know, giving talks is part of it. However, not everyone is going to want to give talks and that is totally fine, right? Or maybe someone wants to give a talk and they don't want to have their camera on and they just want it to be the voice. That's okay. Or maybe someone likes writing blogs or they like doing technical documentation. It's really kind of, I would ask that person, what are the things that you're interested in doing and how can your work in that open source project blend into that as a sort of natural extension? I think that, you know, we live in a very competitive world and whether we like it or not, sharing in some way or having, you know, something to show, obviously, you know, with GitHub repos, you can see, and having been someone that worked in the hiring process and still does for certain companies, one of the things I ask is like, I don't really care where you went to university. I'm much more interested in seeing the kind of work that you can do. So showing me things that you've done, whether it's talks, whether it's documentation, whether it's um, participating, organizing an event, things like that. I would say in terms of thinking about what's the next step, what's something that you like to do and how can the open source contributions that you're doing play into that? And so in terms of the next step, um, I would say that I would say, you know, you can be proposing new features. You can be, you know, and also as well, talking to the maintainers and saying, Hey, look, I've been doing this for a while. What, what do you think would be interesting? Those maintainers, if they're not grateful and excited about someone coming to them and saying like, asking that kind of a question, um, I don't know what kind of maintainer that would be. Because if you say, look, I've done this, 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 and this, and this, you know, documenting your journey, sharing your story, showing other people how you've done it so that they can do it as well. Um, giving back in that sense, I think that's good. But beyond that, you know, get, giving a talk, creating a short series about it. And when I say giving a talk, a talk could be one minute long, it could be 30 seconds, you know, like it can just be, you know, a demo um, put on, you know, two times faster on, on 2X so that you can be speaking over it and saying, this is what I did here and here and here. Um, if you want to actually talk about that further at some point, find me on this, on this Discord or, or whatever, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that further. But I understand that that's a natural feeling to have. It's like, well, I've been here, but you know, kind of what's next? Um, I think there, there's no one answer to that question. The most important answer is the one that works best for you um, based on the things that you're interested in. And I think making the maintainers part of that conversation or other contributors as well um, would, be, would be an interesting thing to keep in mind. But thank you for the question. Yeah, no, thanks a million, uh, Shabam. That's an act. That's a that's a, re a really good one because, like, from from my side, we uh, have been having a good amount of success, and uh, people have been able to to find a, a lot of good first issues, right? And a, a lot of uh, a lot of time, it's like where those that's the ninety percent of the new kind of issues that go up. But people like yourself and, and other contributors too, then. Um, are have been contributing a lot of good first issues. Maybe we need to think of other labels. Maybe we need to add more good complex issues. And maybe they're not even issues. Maybe they're they're bigger um, epics. And and for that, uh, we we need um, as 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 a community to to make it easier uh, to have maybe like more 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 chances to to have more uh, conversations with um contributors like yourself that 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 are looking to take um more uh, steps that, that that are going to challenge you in in kind of like more meaningful ways uh, i suppose and and that and that's why on on our side at least we we are um doing a lot of work now to to try to create some sort of a structure, but I don't know if it's going to necessarily be a game or something, but but yeah, something similar to the to the Cilium uh, contribution ladder to be able to 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 create some sort of a program that that you can then see if you want to fit yourself into or not, in which you can contribute more than just the the good first issues. So uh, thanks for challenging us uh, in that way. Um, having said that, let's jump into a section uh, that um, a good few of the, the content creators that I uh, listen to, they, they do and I, I quite like. So uh, this is definitely not original to hear, but it's a, it's a rapid fire question in which I'm just going to shoot out some topics. And, and you just um, tell me if they're overrated or underrated in your opinion. And uh, if you want to elaborate, feel free. The first one is nonlinear career paths. Totally underrated. 
That's I, how rapid fire we going. <laughs> Very good. No, I totally agree. I, I think they're they're quite underrated also. What about the Basque country in the north of Spain? Uh, underrated. Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, uh, rapping as a tech skill. Completely underrated and completely underpaid. <laughs> I would have to. I would have to agree, but um, yeah, unfortunately, um, I've tried in the mirror, and it's it's not a tech skill that I'm going to be able to pick up anytime soon. What about uh, in-person tech conferences? Mm. Uh, I would just say rated. Uh, I wouldn't say under or over. And I, as someone who does a lot of work online, I do, I really do like the in-person factor, but I will also say that it's completely from a position of privilege being able to travel to these things. Yes, there are a lot of things that happen as well, locally speaking, um, but there is an element of privilege that's built into that. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the really, really big ones and stuff like that, like, I think that, I don't want to say it's overrated because it is really good and you get to be with tons of people at the same time, but I don't want people to feel like that the value of connecting with people at a local level is somehow less. Um, it's just different. Very cool. Okay. And the last one is the current surge in AI popularity. Overrated. Um, yeah, I'd say overrated. The, um, it's, it's natural that it's, that it's getting, that there is that surge. Um, and, and the thing is, I'm not an expert on this, so like, this is just my non-technical person's opinion, but I think, it's a, I think it's one of many hype trains. I think there is some really cool stuff happening there, but I think I'm always hesitant when things that are devaluing human you know, creativity, and also as someone who doesn't write code, because I'm talking to a lot of people who do, the amount of creativity that goes into writing code and that AI can be a tool, but, and that can be used creatively by, by the people who are, um, who are in control of it. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm always a little bit hesitant when it comes to that stuff. Perfect. Yeah. And, and if, if any of these takes do um, age um, not too well, um, I promise not to edit them down and send them to you um, in the next few years. <laughs> no, but I think I think uh, your, your takes are, are fine. So I just want to give everyone a chance if you do have any extra questions to put them in the chat now because I'm going to go ahead and ask my last question if you don't mind. So it would be like in your opinion, what would you recommend for like a young professional that may want a similar career to yours? Or maybe who is on a different track now, but maybe would want to mix in a little bit more of the skills that that that, that are that are useful in, in DevRel, like content creation and 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 and, and being uh, creative with with different ways of, of, of expressing themselves. Um, yeah, what would you what would you advise a young Bart? Um, yeah, I would I would say get out there and start doing it. Um, I would have, I would have told myself to learn to get a camera and start doing that sooner. Um, because I was always working with other people who did the recordings. Um, so I would say, yeah, learn, you know, learning, learning the tools, you know, of the, of the trade, whether it's for recording podcasts and videos and editing and stuff like that. I definitely would have started with that earlier. I would also just say that to anybody who's in this field is that, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. So before you organize an event for a thousand people, organize one for 10 and don't kill yourself if only three people show up and two of them are your friends and one of them is a family member, that's okay. Like, don't worry about it. It's part of the process. And it would really distress the fact that you just have to get out there and, and do it. And that you will get feedback that you won't like. Don't worry about it. Just keep doing your thing. Um, find sources of inspiration and eventually reach out to them. Um, you'll find that if you have something interesting to share, uh, the saying like, hey, I've been watching your content for a while and I really enjoy how you do this, this, or this specifically. Um, those people in general, if you, if you give them that kind of recognition and then you also say like, hey, would you mind taking a look at my stuff at some point? The worst thing that can happen is they'll say no. So don't be afraid of that. Um, be active, be generous, get out there and, and, and share your skills and, and enjoy the process. Um, I would just say that if I could take anything away is that I would have been so hard on myself for such a long period of time. I, in terms of expecting things to happen super quickly and some of these things just take time. So it's, it, it is a process 
and just reflect on what you're learning and and like i said um embrace the fact that not everything is going to work and that a lot of things won't the the question is the important thing there is how can you make sure that you learn from those experiences and how can you stop something as quickly as possible if you're if you're getting the feeling that's not working um but yeah i think that it's not it's not as difficult as it seems but it's not for everybody um particularly on the side of organizing events if you've never organized events it might seem really fun and glamorous there's cool stuff and you get to interact with a lot of people but there's a lot of stress and a lot of small details that you have to keep in mind that it's normal that some people might do it for a while and then say you know what this isn't for me because there's a lot of pressure and there's always going to be that i think people that are in this space for a while kind of get addicted to it or they just know that's how it's going to be but um but anyway we just mostly encourage the fact of scaling um start small and and focus on like i said focus on things that you find fun get inspired get inspiration from other content creators and and try to find as many ways as possible to be original um that's what i would emphasize very well put thanks many for that um thanks many in, in in general for the conversation today for answering our questions it's been really really good i didn't expect anything less um what's um on the calendar for the for uh, the tail warden events here in the future is next friday we have not not tomorrow but next friday we have um the the monthly community call and then we will um uh, announce the the up and coming events so having said that thanks a million again bart it's been an absolute pleasure and um Likewise. catch you next time bye everyone perfect thanks so much for the questions folks happy to continue the conversation elsewhere and thanks a lot for having me, Jake. It was really fun. All the best. Cheers. Bye-bye.